Good morning, everybody. My name is Gillian Harvey. I am a I am a PhD student with Charles Sturt University in Australia. I live in Adelaide, and I'm de doing my PhD with lots and lots of um, emails and phone calls and Skype messages between me and my supervisors. My interest is also in technology for the elderly, but I am looking at uh, the what we call the oldest old. So there are several stages of elderly, with the oldest old being those in the 80 plus age group, which has been described as the fourth age. The global population of elderly people is steadily increasing. And while innovations in technology are also advancing rapidly, the elderly are increasingly unable to keep up. Many of those in the fourth age have not been exposed to technology in their home or working lives and are at a dis disadvantage as more and more daily tasks are being performed electronically. Access to information, resources and services is increasingly reliant on technology, leaving the older user users at a disadvantage when they need to navigate an interface which is quite different to what they've learned and to which they've become accustomed. Relatively little work has been done in relation to technology use by the fourth age, and so my focus is an exploration of how these citizens can be brought into the digital age. While this fourth age group of people are not averse to learning how to use technology, attempts to assist them with training courses aimed at their level of expertise have had varying degrees of success. As people age, they become less mobile and less able to attend such courses. They also experience increasing physical difficulties, including, including visual and motor coordination challenges. Advances in technology can lead to isolation and ultimately a digital divide. Some research has investigated training courses and online communities, which assist the oldest old, examining whether these are useful for this age group, and if not, what, what might be the alternatives. Many of our elderly wish to remain independent and living in their own homes for as long as possible, but while it's acknowledged that they need support to remain there, a large number are restricted in their use of technology in their homes. A certain level of independence can be achieved by the use of assistive technology devices, but the elderly need to be persuaded of their benefit and relevance to themselves. The alternative is often that they will need to move from their homes to retirement villages or assisted living environments. As they become less mobile, the ability of the fourth age to take part in social activities also decreases. Some have been introduced to social networking sites such as Facebook, but many prefer face-to-face -face communication. Smartphones and tablet devices provide easy access to information and social contact, but this also requires knowledge, skill, and financial resources. The fourth age, who lived through the years of the Great Depression, are averse to spending money on new equipment every few years. Yet computer operating systems are constantly being upgraded and over time the interfaces are changing, which leaves older users at the disadvantage of not only cost, but learning in regards to those changes to technology, applications and interfaces. I have a little story about Rose, who is 85 years old, and she phoned one day in some distress when her laptop with Windows Vista installed refused to start up. When Rose was told that it might be impossible to recover the computer, she was extremely upset and protested that it had not been used very much and indeed was only bought after her husband passed away some six and a half years earlier. There followed some discussion around the possibility of her using an iPad instead, which might be easier to manage since she only used her computer for email and internet browsing. 
No, she protested, I want my computer. She had grown accustomed to being able to communicate with her family over email and keep up to date with news stories online. She was delighted when the computer was eventually recovered, but being so outdated, it's really only a matter of time before it happens again. Rose is not comfortable with change, and that's evident by her reluctance to change to a tablet device. She's also not been willing to embrace other assistive, assistive technology devices, such as hearing aids or personal emergency devices. She accepts that these may be helpful to other elderly people, but considers that they are not relevant to her. As was the case with Rose, many information and communication communication technologies are perceived by members of the fourth age to be of little or no relevance or use to themselves, even though access to information, resources and services is increasingly reliant on technology. Learning to use technology and adapting to the ever-changing interfaces present challenges for the oldest old. Three reasons for non-use of ICT in a study of Portuguese residents have been ident identified as attitudinal, functional and physical. Attitudinal is defined as the elderly being willing to try technology, but they're either generally indifferent or they lack the self-confidence to persevere. Functional is defined as a lack of access to a computer at home or they do not have the skills necessary to use it. And physical means they have physical or mental limitations preventing them from using the technology. This research is in its early stages, so be kind with your questions. The focus is to explore what factors facilitate or hinder the fourth age from taking advantage of information technology and to keep up with advancing technologies and ways to address that now and in the future. The challenge is, how do you bring information technology to them, making sure that it is relevant to them and enabling them to continue to use it? To address this dilemma, the following research questions have been identified. What factors influence the successful access to and continued use of information technologies for the oldest users? And what are the enablers or inhibitors to the oldest old embracing the use of assistive technologies. These factors may include, but not be restricted to, the, the factors referred to earlier as attitudinal, functional and physical. Although the use of computers and the internet among older adults is increasing, there is an age-based divide whereby, compared to other ca age categories, older people are reporting less use of PCs and the internet. Con comparisons of ICT penetration by age for various OECD, OECD countries in 2000, including Australia, showed that for people aged 18 to 24, close to 90% of them accessed the internet whilst for people aged 55 to 64, it was less than 50% 50, 50 and for people aged 65 and over, it was well under 20%. A report of ageing in Germany claimed, however, that the situation was changing and that there were indications that technology could make a significant contribution to ageing successfully. Those aged over 80 are still left behind in the use of the internet and technology in the United States. Recent Australian Bureau of Statistics data correlates to these figures with 97% of 15 to 17 year olds reporting use of the internet, while only 46% of those aged 65 or older are internet users. We've seen that an example of the age-based divide is that some some seniors experience access limitations due to age-related disabilities. It's been suggested that the provision of a publicly accessible IT pavilion in a city park or an internet kiosk 
in other public places might assist with use. However, given the prevalence of disability with increasing age and consequent geographical and mobility issues, public access through community centres, schools and libraries alone does not sufficiently overcome the challenges faced by seniors with age-related disabilities. While it can be of benefit to those elderly who are still mobile, what of the shut-ins, the elderly who do not venture to such places easily, who are reliant on friends or family to transport them and who spend most of their time inside their own homes? There are a significant number of assistive technology devices or geron technologies which can be useful in assisting to maintain independence and continued well-being. Geron technology is the combination of gerontology and technology and can be defined as the study of technology and ageing for ensuring good health, full social participation and independent living through the entire lifespan. These geron technologies include assistive technology devices marketed to people with hearing loss, memory loss, cognitive and other disabilities. Bookings for buses, taxis, cinemas and health appointments can all be done online. A number of technologies are available to assist with age-related issues. These include, but are not limited to, vision and hearing aids, mobility aids such as wheelchairs and scooters, communication devices to assist people with speech difficulties, emergency call buttons and initiatives to provide health care in the home. One of these initiatives introduced in Europe and America and in particular the Netherlands to counteract problems with nursing shortages is home telecare which is an audio-visual connection between a home-dwelling client and remote healthcare professionals using communication technologies. The connection with a health professional takes place through a computer or television screen and allows the elderly to maintain their independence in their own homes longer while pro providing assurance to those caring for them that their health needs are being met. One of the perceived advantages of this system is its relative ease of use once relevant training has been provided. While these assistive technology devices are helpful for anyone with a disability regardless of age, they are particularly beneficial for the very old to enable them to remain independent for as long as possible. A number of focus groups were conducted with older adults living in communities in Europe. While it was reported that the participants were aware of the digital divide of technology use between generations and were willing to embrace the use of various ICTs, they nevertheless displayed a lack of interest in assistive technology devices which they perceived as having negative connotations. So it appears that while it has been shown that elderly people are willing to learn about computers, they're still reluctant to embrace assistive technology devices in their lives. This reluctance of elderly people to acknowledge their need for the use of ATDs has led to a study of robot technology. While the participants, again, could see they might be helpful for others, they were still not ready to accept the technologies for themselves. These perceptions would need to be taken into account when configuring artificially intelligent devices for the elderly. I'm wondering whether perhaps the term robot was a reason for the lack of enthusiasm, as some of the responses from participants related to their perceptions of the size of robots, along with concerns about a reduction of jobs for humans and possible safety issues. In contrast, others have concluded that the elderly are willing to embrace technology if they perceive it has value to their situation. However, there are issues with increasing functionality of devices, much of which is not, which is not relevant and not user-friendly to the elderly. Devices targeted to the elderly need to be more closely designed to their requirements and abilities. Perhaps one initiative would be to investigate methods of addressing Rose's protestation earlier in this paper, I want my computer. The elderly may be better equipped to handle changing technology around them 
if their personal devices and interfaces remain familiar to them, dissociated from the underlying technology. Benefits can be obtained from exploring what factors facilitate or hinder people from using technology. Design of technology for the elderly needs to take into account their specific requirements. Training is of particular importance in assisting with their acquisition of self-confidence and continued use of the technology. Interestingly, the, el the elderly do not like to be taught by younger people or their children and it has been recommended that these training environments should be led by older adults. Consideration also needs to be given to the future sustainability of assistive technology devices for the elderly. Those who currently are reliant on these technologies for their health and well-being are not always considered with the inevitable upgrades and improvements that are made. For instance, the Royal Automobile Association in Adelaide, South Australia, recently warned that the new national broadband network rollout by the Australian government will put at risk a large number of users of personal alarms which they assert are not compatible with the network. While this is not insurmountable, it will involve changes to current installations, disruption to the users, possible failure of devices, and depending on the provider, it may also incur an additional cost. So, since global populations are ageing, at least in the Western world, one implication is that more seniors than ever before will require access to technology and the acquisition of the skills to use it. This trend is likely to continue as governments and other agencies involved with seniors require more electronic interaction in order to save costs and increase access. Yet many of the oldest old are unprepared for this change and are lacking in the skills and confidence to be able to access the required data. There are efforts taking place. I don't know what I've done there. There are efforts taking place to train the elderly to provide them with these tools and skills to attain and maintain access. It would seem that assistive technology devices have the potential to be extremely beneficial to our fourth age population, yet many are reluctant to take advantage of these for various reasons. Clearly, perceptions by the elderly of a need for the technology, as well as its ease of use, will dictate whether acceptance is positive or negative. Closer attention also must be paid by governments and other authorities when planning infrastructure changes which may impact on technologies used and relied upon by our older citizens. Thank you. Any questions? Oh. Is it working? Yeah. For a short moment there, I thought that we were in the age of the Sauron and the and the destroy, destroying of the ring, because that's called fourth age in, <laughs> in Tolkien's books. <laughs> so, fortunately not. Uh, yes, please. Please go first. Yeah, thank you. Um, hello. Uh, I um, noticed you said that um, elderly people do not like to be taught by younger people. And I was wondering if this is really a matter of age, or if it is a matter of the speed, maybe, of teaching. So if younger people might be adequate to teach them, if they just slow down, maybe. Or if it's really about sympathy, empathy with the teacher. I don't know if you have some idea about that. That, that would be an interesting thing to, um, to explore. Um, the Literature that I've read has suggested that they that the elderly are um, not comfortable with being te uh, taught by the the young, and that may be for all the reasons that you've just mentioned. So it would be an interesting um, side, a uh, little side um, step to explore that and to see whether that could be overcome. Thank you. Well, thank you. Mm. So interesting that we're sat next to each other. Uh, the synapses, something obviously leapt. Um, <laughs> uh, 
on, on a similar theme, just to say, certainly IBM uh, in the past decade, uh, and certainly with Italian initiatives, uh, there have been explorations of the way in which grandchildren and grandparents uh, can work together and learn together, mm -hmm. uh, and also, in a way, uh, children, uh, you know, very often support their their parents. And and there is a, I, I I think you may find that there is evidence of a willingness to to learn. So it would be well worth exploring. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just uh, another piece of information as well, particularly on the robotics side. Um, in around December 2016, January 2017, there's probably going to be an announcement of a whole set of projects that will look at robotics uh, use with elderly persons in both Japan specifically uh, and all the European Union. Okay. So that's certainly going to be something worth looking out yeah. for. Um, but I wondered whether you'd look, whether you'd thought also about expanding your your focus of work uh, to the carers of the most elderly, elderly, uh, or whether you're whether you are going to focus and would like to focus, and there's enough rationale to focus on the elderly, elderly themselves as the end users. My my focus at the moment is on the elderly. Um, I'm not really uh, looking at anybody aged under the age of 80. Um, I have a lot of people aged 50 who, who, when I speak to them, who say, oh, that, that's really interesting, and, and they're, they're way outside my, my demographic. I am, I am concerned about the elderly and the, way that the digital divide, the way that they've been left aside with, with all of the changes that are happening. Um, the carers might be a side issue if they're... Um, um, uh, helping the elderly, but the, the training that I'm looking at will be for the for the oldest old. Mm. Uh, and, and thank you for that, as it were, concentrating on a on a single focus and focusing on on a single item, because I really understand it's one of the mo <laughs> the heaviest challenges for many PhD candidates and researchers. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I would say thanks very much indeed for that particular yeah. reply. It is, it is um, principally my focus. I don't know whether you're aware of uh, the recent debacle we had in Australia with our latest census, and it was done online. Um, the first thing that happened was that hackers got into the government, uh, the ABS database, and crashed it. But it meant that elderly people were having to ring up or send off for a paper form to do their census because the default was that you would do it online. And if you weren't able to do it online, then you had to make the step to, to order that and, and make sure that you were compliant because if you didn't, you were going to be charged. Then, of course, the system crashed and it was a huge, huge disaster, not only for the general population, but it was a, it was a big thing for, for many of the elderly as well. And if they continue down that path and continue to do that, at some point in the future, the paper-based option isn't going to be there, and then where will our elderly be? Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. You'll be aware of um, the Australian Government's initiative of setting up uh, internet kiosks for uh, older people. Our church runs one mm. and it's been very interesting that the age group that you're talking about, which are a little bit older than us, <laughs> um, it's the ones who are really wanting to come and learn are those who want to keep in touch and keep up with their grandchildren. Mm. They don't want the grandchildren to show them how to do this, but they want to go down and get the help at the internet kiosk at church where they're in a familiar mm. environment, you know, and we have volunteers different days of the week who are there mm. to help them. Uh, and they'll say, I want to know about Skype yes. because um, I want to contact a grandchild who's not living in the same metropolitan area that we are and... 
and he, they want to talk to me on Skype. Hmm. So and I want you to show me how to do it. And that's where I'm at. And that's, that, that seems to be just speaking to the people who are volunteers in the kiosk. That seems to be one of the imperatives hmm. uh, that, that um, our group are coming in for. Uh, they want to get that knowledge so that they, they can be in command hmm. of that interaction, particularly with grandchildren hmm. who are living further away. Hmm. Yes. And that's great. And, and as I mentioned, it's great for people who are mobile and can get to the, the kiosks. But, yeah. But, but, and, and that's also where iPads come in very handy for the elderly if, if they can be uh, taught how to use an iPad. It can be um, more, more easy for them to, to access that kind of, of um, technology. Thanks, Gillian. That's really good. Um, <laughs> just an observation from what you were saying about the census. When I was on the Metrolink yesterday on my way over, which I thought was great. I love the Metrolink. It's far nicer than the underground, which I also experienced yesterday, London. Um, oh. But it was, I was sat with um, a lady. She was probably about 65 with a grandchild in a pushchair, and we were trying to establish whether or not the Eccles line did go off to Media City and back out again. And it turned out we had to get off and then get on a different train and get off. But that was in nowhere explained. Um, she did not, she said, well, there's no one to ask, is there? I said, no, no. there is no one to ask. You just get your ticket and hope for the best. Yeah. But we, there was a, quite a few of us obviously worked it out through process of elimination. So I, I put myself in the same category as that 65 year old, <laughs> uh, you know, intelligent person with 20 years industrial experience. I couldn't work it out. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of issues around inclusion generally which comes to my question about your research focus, although you know, my colleague there says it's a very good thing to focus on one thing about the age group. But what I'm particularly interested in, in your findings, whether this is another phase of research, is about the uh, uh, sort of slightly more subtle demographic slant. So assuming someone is 80, but is their attitude different if they are a retired architect, headmaster, bank manager? or if they are a retired manual labourer, bricklayer, shopkeeper, accountant, mm. you know, what, is there a variation in like a professional background, a kind of a, an educational background? Have you found any of these sort of skew your findings at all? Uh, not in this, I haven't mentioned that in this paper, but in, in my overall research, I have identified that there are different, um, the digital divide takes different parts. So there's a, 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 a educational divide and a financial divide and a social divide and all of those little sub parts are all, all, all part of it too. So somebody who may have been a university professor um, might have a different attitude than somebody who was, well, I'll, I'll, I, won't, I won't specify, but, but not, not as well educated perhaps. But um, I, will, I will be discussing those those different areas in the, the final thesis. Yes. Uh, hi. Um, I I worked with Jesse and David on the on, on the sort of like the research yeah. in the previous talk. And one thing that I was quite interested in is when you were talking about um, participants not really wanting to get advice from younger people. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we started to see, I'd be interested to hear your views on it, is around co-browsing and co-experience. Mm -hmm. So when two people of a similar age are interacting with the technology, they kind of, we, we started to see people encouraging each other on. Have you okay. seen that as well? And is, has that been a motivator to encouraging interaction in your study? I haven't done much data gathering yet so I haven't I haven't seen that as I said it's, I'm still in the early stages and I'm about to go into the data gathering um, phase of the project when I get back to Australia um, so I, I expect that that will be something that I will see I was quite interested in the research that I'd read about them not wanting to be taught by young people and that will be something that I'll be wanting to explore as well mm. There will be coffee and biscuits.